Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. This is really exciting. Okay. So we're going to talk tonight about things that God created and, 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 and the benefit that he has provided for us because of that. This quote, um, Thinking God's After His Thoughts, was by a man named Johann Kepler. Uh, he was considered one of the greatest astronomers of all time, discovered that the, how the planets move in elliptic orbits around the sun instead of everything moving around the earth and proved it mathematically and observationally. Uh, but he was a strong Christian. And uh, he said, just figuring out how the universe works is part of what God has given us to do. And we're merely thinking God's thoughts after he's all thought of everything himself. And it's, it's our privilege and honor to do that. And one of the things I like to tell young people when I'm speaking in colleges or schools or whatever uh, is that God's very first command to mankind at the very end of the very first chapter of the Bible, after he'd made Adam and Eve, he said to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and take dominion over essentially everything he made. All the, lists all these animals and everything. Now, dominion. What, what in the world is dominion? Uh, it's, it's the English translation in the, 19th, in the 1400s of an ancient Hebrew word. And as you study the language and you go back, you find these words has various ways to translate them. But the essence of dominion is to study something, to understand something, and to control it. See, God still owns it, but he said, look at everything I made. All these gorgeous animals and the planet and how it operates. And I want you to study it, understand it, and control it. Now that is science, which is really kind of cool. The very first thing God told people to do was to do science. Now, I kind of asked myself, what, you know, God, and I'm going to back up a second. This is just a little extra tonight. Time is part of the created universe. Time, space, matter, and energy. And we now know, because we studied it and know a lot about how this creation God makes operates, that time isn't absolute. Um, you can measure time at sea level and with an absolute identical stopwatch that works based on molecular movement, I mean, super, super placed at sea level and another one placed at the top of a mountain, you can compare. depending on the mass in the vicinity and the acceleration and the movement of things, where you're measuring time, it will move at different speeds. It's part of the created universe. And since God made the whole universe, and time is part of the universe, God is not trapped inside of time. Now, it's kind of obvious to Christians, but I'm not sure they think that through. That means when you're praying to God, he has all the time he wants to listen to only you. Out of, of the, the seven billion people on this planet, the one who made the entire universe can focus his attention on just you. He's filled with all these things that are going to happen in the future because he can see the future, the past, and the present all at the same time. It's why every problem that is happening to you, God could have stopped it. He's totally capable of changing anything that's happening. He is allowing it. Therefore, it has a purpose. He knew before you were made. He's told us this. He knew us before we were, before the world was created. He knew us. So there's incredible comfort in knowing God is outside of time. And no matter what you're going through, it doesn't surprise him. And he can take care of it. But he's teaching us, trust me, trust me, trust me. This life is so short. I'm building your endurance. I'm building your compassion. I'm building your empathy. I'm building your character. Just trust me with what you're going through, even if it's tough. That was just an extra. <laughs> now, but I asked myself, God knew in advance when he said, take dominion over creation, that we are going to mess it up. We're going to covet it. We're going to murder people for it. Nation is going to go after nation to steal their resources. We're going to war 
worship it. We're going to pollute it. We're going to do all this stuff. So why would he give us charge over it? Well, I came up with two reasons. The first is this one. And here's that command, by the way. I have dominion over everything. The fish, the birds, everything that moveth upon the earth. Why? This is the first one. And I mentioned this this morning. By looking at creation, we can absolutely know that God exists. Amen. Amen. See, again, I, I try to get these young people to understand this or living for the moment. God doesn't just want you to believe he exists or hope he exists or wonder if he exists. God expects us to absolutely know, like we know nothing else, that he exists. And a big part of that is because feelings come and go. We can look at the things he has made, and it can be absolutely no doubt there's no other possible explanation for the existence of time, space, and matter, and the universe and stars, the planet Earth in its perfect position, the intricacy of plants and animals, all of these things, the parts of animals, the, the chemicals we're made out of, none of it could have just happened. And we only know that when we study creation. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's one of the reasons he told us to take command over it and have dominion over it. But there's also a second one, and that's the topic of tonight. Whoops, where did it go? Well, I'll just, I'm not sure what happened to it. I'm just, I'll come back to it later. But it's in, it is, it shows up later as another Bible verse. It's from the book of Job. Uh, God said, ask the animals and they shall teach you. Ask the birds and they shall tell you. By looking at what God has made, we can learn these incredible insights. Not just the principles by which things operate, but specific inventions that have benefited all mankind. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. Now, I'm going to start with flight. Um, I, I, I don't know, maybe this isn't true, but I have a feeling mankind probably never would have figured out how to fly had it not been for birds. That's right. And I think from the moment Adam and Eve were created, and God had already created all these other animals and forms of life, when he looked up on that first day and he saw those birds, he thought, wow, it would be so cool to be able to fly up above things and look down. You know, I, I think from the moment man started to make stuff like things that could fold and making paper airplanes and wishing they could fly. <laughs> That we do. By the way, how many? This is a fun thing I always ask. There's lots of interaction tonight, so stay away. I had this dream a hundred times if I had it once when I was growing up. How many of you dreamed as a recurring dream you could fly when you were young? Well, raise your hand. Look around, everybody. Isn't that interesting? Probably a third of the people here had that dream over and over and over again. Anybody still have it? No, the old folks. Way back there, yeah. I don't know why it disappears. I loved that dream. But anyway, we kept having these dreams. Well, turns out we learned to make movies before we learned to fly. Uh, back in the early, middle 1800s, we learned to make photographs, tin types of the Civil War. Edison figured out how to string them together to make movies in the 1880s. And we didn't learn to fly until 1903. And they took movies of some of these old guys in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s trying to figure out how to fly because we were working at it hard. So I strung together a bunch of these, a little montage. I got to turn on my speaker. Um, okay, I want you to watch this early attempts of mankind trying to learn to fly. <laughs> That's the pilot. Now what did they all have in common? 
shaped very much like a wing, but they didn't work. It wasn't until the Wright brothers and others had figured out this principle that they, they, they added another key, realized the principle by which a bird is able to fly that we succeeded in flight. You see, we remained bird earthbound for 5,800 years. It was the bird's wings that gave us the key. And we realized when you move that shape, that curved shape with a tapered back through the air, the air has to move faster up and over it, slower below it, so you create a low pressure area above the wing. And the, 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 the wing is literally pushed upward by the higher pressure air below it to create lift. But the Wright brothers realized in order to succeed for man to fly, you have to have a really light craft and you have to get it moving fast enough to create enough lift. So they succeeded in December of uh, 1903. They flew in a straight line from probably not, not much further from, from here out to the main road out there, uh, you know, about two or 300 feet, just straight line and landed. Orville did it, or Orville Wright. Then the next day they went and they got a film crew and they got newspaper reporters. And both Wilbur and Orville climbed on that plane. And by the way, Wilbur and Orville Wright's father was a Presbyterian minister back when Presbyterians were sending missionaries all over the world. It was a strong Christian denomination. Okay? They trusted and believed in God. And if God has done something, it's for a reason. And we ought to be able to understand and use it for our benefit. And they realized there's no reason we can't fly because God has built a world that allows that sort of thing. Uh, so they worked at it, worked at it, worked at it. Brought in the film crew, and then they filmed essentially one of the very first flights of mankind ever made. And, and, and I've seen this film 40 times, and I still love it. Almost 6,000 years after creation, mankind finally understands what God has made enough to learn to fly. Here's one of the very first flights of mankind. pull weight up in a tower, and it's that weight that drops down that gets the plane moving fast enough, kind of like the aircraft being thrown off an aircraft carrier. So there's the two of them now on their airplane, there goes the weight, and off it goes. There's the newspaper reporters. in a straight line, they're turning and banking and flying around the field and coming in for a landing. Do you, you see that one guy with a band that's one of the reporters? He is so stunned at what he's looking at, he drops to one knee and just stares. This is, it's unfathomable. Mankind is fly heavier than air and flying. I don't think we can understand how stunning that was for these people the first time it was ever happened. See, it's like, it's like we're little three, two-year-old pre-kindergarten children compared to the God who's way beyond even that analogy. And he has given us a sandbox to play in called the, the creation. And he says, go play in it. Go learn things. Go do things to benefit others. Go discover things. Go invent things. Go enjoy the beauty, the majesty, and the functionality and usefulness of what I made for you. Amen. The animals don't get anything out of it other than survival. It's only us that can appreciate it. And that's what God did for us. It's just stunning to think of what he's done for us. And flight is just one example. Now, that's just, not just the ability to fly. We continue to look at creation in order to innovate flight. You see, as planes got faster and faster, we needed to figure out how to make the wings more and more efficient. 
So we literally looked for what was kind of the fastest bird that we could find to see how are its wings shape. And I want to, I want to show you the swift bird. This bird flies on a level flight. They can track at over 104 miles per hour. Now I expect them standing still on this one. It's, it's expressway at 65 or 70 miles an hour. There's flying right on by it. That's the fastest bird on level flight. Okay, now peregrine hawks will die at 200 miles an hour, but on level flight, this one's faster. Flies almost continuously. Biologists have tracked it, put trackers on them, uh, kind of calculated that they think this bird, in its lifetime, because it will fly day and night often, it doesn't even like to stop to sleep, and I'll tell you about that in a second. It'll fly two and a half million miles. That's like eight times all the way to the moon and back, or eight times circling the entire bird. It's all the long way, because it flies so much in the years that it lives. It drinks while it's flying, and I've observed this. It will actually be flying along, and it'll dip down, Go right along the surface of a lake or stream, open his mouth, grab a drink, and swoop back up. Doesn't want to bother to stop to take a drink. It sleeps while flying. Scientists have tracked him flying all night long, all day, all night the next day. And they're wondering, how do they do this? How do they keep flying? Well, they catch insects in the air without stopping to get food. They swoop down a drink to get water. But how do they get sleep? Turns out, and again, we study this to our amazement, this bird is able to shut down half of its brain, and it closes one eye, and it just keeps flying. And then it shuts and sleeps the other half of its brain, and closes the other eye. And again, when I, I, I've used this example whenever we're overseas in our public school systems, and we've spoken to about 120,000 students over the years now. I, I, I tell them, that, now don't try this in math class, it doesn't work with us. No. And then, it makes babies walk fly, but male and female. It doesn't stop just to build the nest and lay the eggs. It loves to fly. Now you'll notice the bird's wings are like swept backward, back like that. They're not straight out. And yet all of the early airplanes, the Wright Brothers airplane, the World War II or World War I biplanes, the World War II airplanes, every one of them, the wings are straight out. The early airliners, the wings are straight out. But as we developed jet engines and airplanes got fast, they realized they've got to modify those wings for a fast flying vehicle to be more maneuverable in order to land more efficiently and turn more efficiently. So they copied the design of the Swift Bird and all modern air airplanes, all modern airplanes that are fast have these swept back wings because of what God did first. But now you have a problem. You've got airplanes that are flying in the range of four to five hundred miles an hour, but they've got to land. And they're heavy. They weigh a million pounds. So when they slow down, they lose their lift. They'll start to flutter like a leaf. And that's called stalling. It's the most dangerous maneuver of an airplane is when a heavy airplane lands. So designers started to look at very large birds. How does a huge bird like a condor or an eagle or a huge goose. How does it land? They discovered that as it lands, it has two wing feathers on the front of its wings that come sticking out. Here's another example. Here's a goose. Here, these feathers stick out as it's coming down slowly to land. What that does is force motor air up around the wing. It increases the lift. If those feathers were out during flight, it would cause all sorts of drag. But as it's slowing down, it increases the lift. So now the bird can land slow, safely. Guess what airplanes have? Flaps. Flaps on the front edges. Exactly like the birds, for the same reason. Because God did it first. It's one last example, and this has nothing to do with flight, but it's kind of interesting. I was walking, this goes back a dozen years or more. I was walking like after dusk, fairly dark, on a path through a forest, and all of a sudden, out of my peripheral vision, this huge object just comes zooming right past me, probably within five or ten foot of my head. And, and I had no idea what it was, but I realized it's some sort of a great big bird, but I heard nothing. And we're talking a bird with a wingspan like this, flying almost right by me in total silence. You guys know what it was? An owl. Owls are the stealth fighters of the avian bird world. 
those mice and rabbits and rodents, they don't know what hit them. All of a sudden, it's just, whoa, they're dead. It's like they don't know this bird is coming. It is so quiet. Well, what's the point of that? Well, it turns out this led to the design of quieter computer fans. See, the early, Robin and I, way back, I don't know, this is probably the late 80s, early 90s, they had just come out with the earliest computers. Did anybody remember what the very first computers were called? The Commodore's. 64s or something. So we, we got one. I'm an engineer, and I thought, this is neat. Couldn't figure out what to do with this stupid thing. It didn't do anything. We would sit for half an hour and watch a screensaver. <laughs> we didn't know what else to do with it. Play a few little silly games. But we did notice when you turn it on, it would go, <laughs> really loud. Because it was very efficient. Its, its processors generated all sorts of heat. It had these big fans blowing lots of air past it keep them from burning out. Well, that's kind of annoying. So the computer designers pretty quickly started to think, how can you move air without making a lot of noise? And they thought of the owl. The owl is essentially something moving through air. Air is moving past this object, and it's not making a lot of noise. And they started to study its wings. And what they discovered is that they have little notches at the end of each feather. It's not in these other wings. And somehow that disturbs or, or, or uh, lowers the turbulence to allow the owl to fly and the air moves past those wings very, very quietly. So they started to make little notches at the end of computer fan fins and realized they were like 20 or 30 percent quieter because God did it first. So that's just flight, okay? Now what this is called is biomimicry. Bio meaning a biological origin. And mimic is to copy, to copy something God made first, except the schools don't visit it that way. It's a growing area of engineering. Almost every major engineering school or medical school has a course or a class on biomimicry because there's so much we've learned from nature. But evolution is always, 100% of the time, given credit. Now, on Wednesday, Oh, they just throw that word at it. Oh, man, look how useful that notch is in that wing. It must have evolved. Oh, look at how those wings are swept back because this bird moves faster. It must have evolved. And by throwing the word at it, in the minds of the researchers, they have now explained it. If it's useful, it must have an advantage, so it must have come from a creature that didn't have it. That's the mindset. Well, I just wonder, you know, God just to shake his head. I've done all of this for, for my people, and I want to draw to me, and this is the response, that, that they just pretend it made itself. And we're going to talk more about this idea that if something useful, it will want to become a slightly modified, more useful creature or some other function or thing, when we talk about this wagon later, that's why it's sitting up here. Well, let's continue with inventions, okay? And again, I, I'm loving this lecture because it's interactive. What do you think major human invention that changed the course of American history happened because of the Osage orange tree? And that's what the proof looks like on that tree. Um, and those of you who have my book Brilliant or have seen this lecture on my video series, you might already know the answer, but um, others, anybody, any ideas? Just shout something out of it. If you got any idea. What could you invent from the Osage orange tree? I, good. I hear these ideas. Golf ball, tennis ball, some sort of medicine ball because it's a big fruit. Uh, now, I, 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 as much as sports is kind of fun and, and I, I, nothing wrong, I don't think it's a major human technological development. Um, so I'm going to give you some clues, okay? It was an invention by a man named Michael Kelly and he first came up with this idea in 1868. Okay, second clue. Okay, so this invention is 146 years ago. Almost 150 years ago it was made. Uh, and still to this day, it sells about 200 million pounds of it a year. Insulation? Good guess. I worked for Dow Chemical in the styrofoam department, but no, not insulation. Uh, it's something that if you placed it in the end, strung it in the end, it would stretch out a million miles of it per year. Now that 
this in a historical context. You know, America was mainly located on the East Coast, up into Ohio, Tennessee, Indiana, and so on, up into the middle 1800s. Uh, not a lot other than Texas and down in New Mexico is going on out west, uh, even up to the Civil War, or especially in the early 1800s. Well, in 1800, I don't have my notes here, but it was like 1805, something like that, Thomas Jefferson made the Louisiana Purchase. It was the land bargain of all mankind, because he actually bought it. For about three cents an acre, Thomas Jefferson doubled the land mass of America, doubled the size of our entire nation for three cents an acre. Bought it from France because they needed some money to, for a war with England, with Napoleon and all. So, in order to get people to move, he sent out Lewis and Clark, kind of mapped it, explored it, saw what was there. And then the government started to make free land available, and there was a massive migration out west throughout the early 1800s all the way up into the late 1800s. Massive migration. Well, in order for people to get there, they had to supply themselves in kind of port cities. So St. Louis was one of those port cities. Chicago was one of those port cities. It also created a um, kind of a start of a shift from an agricultural society to an urban society. We had lots more people living in cities. So they're not raising their own food. And to feed a nation that's growing in big cities, you've got to be able to get lots of food to feed these people in this growing nation that's becoming urban. Well, to do that, the people raising the food have to make money. And one of the richest sources of food is cattle. Uh, way more meat out of a cow than you do in a chicken. You're going to raise 1,000, 5,000 chickens to, to get what you get out of a cow. But you've got to contain them crazy animals because they're going to roam. Well, in the east, you have lots of fences, okay? You just cut down some trees, you build a fence, you don't even need nails, you just line up as a picket fence. But out west, in the Great Plains, you got nothing. It's just big old open fields, and that's where you needed the food that supply Chicago and St. Louis. So, what are you gonna do? This is what the farmers did for decades. They would build Osage, or plant Osage orange hedges to hedge in the, the cows. And the reason was these trees have these nasty spikes. And just like you wouldn't like to shove your way through a bunch of branches like, like that, neither do the cows. So they could fence in their field to own their cattle and raise them and not have to chase them down. Very common in the 1800s. And the trees grew very fast. But it would still take decades to completely fence in a field. Now, do you have any idea what this invention is? Barbed wire. Michael Kelly looked at that and he said, we just got some spikes sticking off of a main line. If I could do that with wire, and by the way, and string it on poles, I could put a fence anywhere in a matter of months instead of years. And if you check out barbed wire, check it out. It is essentially an exact duplicate of an Osage orange tree. Matter of fact, he called his company the Osage Orange Barbed Wire Fence Company. <laughs> because God did it first. And as I was reading about this, one of the articles, it said that it wasn't the Colt 44 that tamed the West with the laws and the sheriffs. It was barbed wire that allowed people to have ownership of private land and use it profitably to make money to feed a nation to allow the migration. That was a key invention that changed our nation because God did it first. In fact, you would have never thought of it had it not been for that tree. Now, this one really changed all of history, uh, and that is the wasp's nest. Anybody, anybody ever seen one of these? I mean, look at this baby. This is what's inside of a wasp's nest. We're talking thousands of those cute little eggs that turn into those cute little critters. <laughs> well, in this case, Antoine, or Rene, Rene Antoine or more, Frenchman, was walking in the woods in 1719, and he got stung by some wasps, and he looks up and he sees one of these big nests, and instead of getting irritated, he starts thinking about these, these, these little insects. I'm going to tear a piece of this off. And he realized 
check this out. This little insect is able to just chew up some pieces of a tree, get it in its mouth, and then it spits it back out, and it creates this really, really thin, really, really flat surface, which is paper. Now, in the 1500s, in the 1600s, in the 1700s, right up until the middle of the 1700s, the only people that had books were the very, very rich, very, very wealthy, very, very uh, affluent. Because we made books from essentially cloth, linen and flax and stuff that you could lay on as cloth, old rags, turn it into, not paper, but cloth. They were sewn together, bound in leather, and books were really expensive. So there was no reason to teach people how to read. Nobody could afford a book. Why would they need to know how to read? So the church was the only people who could tell people what was in God's word because people couldn't read it for themselves. So it became very, very corrupt, and very few people even knew what God's word had to say. Uh, and, and there was a very aristocratical uh, class, and there was a very poor working class. But it all changed when we developed the ability to mass produce paper. Because now the printing presses, which were developed earlier, could just print books very, very cheaply in mass production. And it drove the Industrial Revolution, it drove the Scientific Revolution, it drove the Reformation of Christianity, all because we learned how to make paper. I want you to imagine a world without paper. I mean, without paper, you know, there would be no pictures, there would be no newspapers. Well, okay, young people, this is a newspaper. <laughs> now, when, when you move your finger down the page, it doesn't change. You actually have to fold it open and read the words. I mean, this is a really old kind of school technology, but it changed the world because this is where you would go to get news. So no newspapers. I mean, how could we know that uh, Pizza Hut back in the days of newspapers was selling their pizzas for like $9.99 with Supreme Pizzas? We find it in the newspaper. So the newspaper was very, very important. Photographs wouldn't have been possible. And again, no paper airplanes without newspapers. <laughs> paper folding, all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, no books. No preserving and passing on of knowledge from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. The growth of universities and education and invention all predicated on the invention of paper. No sending of, uh, you know, charge card applications in the mail. Well, this is a bad example. Little gift bags you can grab and put stuff into. Envelopes for sending out notes. None of it without paper. We would still be carrying, you know, 10 pounds of coins in our pockets. You know, no paper money without paper. Easy transport of our possessions with money. Uh, no quicker picker upper without paper. We'd be using rags. Uh, and what's coming next? Let's see. Oh, this is oh boxes. You know, we would still be shipping stuff around in barrels. No Amazon.com. They gotta have boxes. I'm describing a world without paper. And then I think you know, the biggie. Looks 
standing there and he sees this little beetle on top of a cut off log. And it's just chewing away at the wood fibers. Just kind of chewing, 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 chewing. And he looks really close. And he thinks, wow, for as small as that insect is, it's really very efficiently cutting through those wood fibers. Now, Buford was a lumberjack. And back in the early 1900s, all the way up till 1946 or so, or after, basically when they made it, they had chainsaws, a motor driving a chain, but they were made just like a crosscut saw, which cuts back and forth. And those saws had little pointed teeth. One's angled one way, the other's angled a little bit the other way. As they're pulled back and forth, they chip away at the wood. So they would be able to change with these little pointed teeth that would spin around and around. And when they did contests between a man with a chainsaw and two men with one of these crosscut saws, both with a little pointed teeth, the men just doing it manually were faster than the chainsaw. So it was very labor intensive to cut down trees right up until the 1850s. I'm sorry, 1950s. Well, this little insect, I don't know if you can see it. Well, okay, it's over here. The timber beetle. It's got these little, what are called mandibles, and they're curved forward like those old Arabian swords. Remember the Arabian swords, they, the scythes, they would like, slice forward at an angle. And that's the way this beetle's thing was carved. And Buford Cox thought, if I put the teeth as a little curved, sharpened curve, one of them on one side of the blade, the other one on the other side of the blade, so that the blade is moving, it slices through the wood instead of chipping away at it, maybe it would be more efficient. Well, it turned out to be like 10 times more efficient. So now you can just slice through trees instead of just chip, 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 chipping your way through. And he developed the Oregon Chainsaw Company, which is still a major company to this day and revolutionized how fast and how cheaply trees could be cut down. Uh, and it drove a massive building industry to the wood structures all over America, especially after World War II, when people needed lots and lots of homes coming home from the war. Um, another one, and again, I'm talking about major developments here. What are the smallest bones in the human body? You're pointing to it, and I heard it over here. It's the ears. There's three little bones. They're named the stirrup, the uh, hammer, and the anvil, because they're sort of shaped a little bit like these things. But they're all placed, sized, and designed exactly right. So that when your eardrum moves, just the, the, the diameter of an atom is all it has to move, then it causes those little bones to amplify that movement, which then causes some fluid inside of your, behind your eardrum to move. And the moving fluid moves these little hairs, and there's millions of tiny little hairs that are connected to millions of nerves that send a signal to the brain, and the brain interprets that amplified signal as a sound so we can hear. It's a phenomenally complex system. Of all these parts are needed, if anything was missing or out of place or misplaced, none of it would work. But what did those bones mean to you? Well, here's a quote. The man who invented what I'm about to describe, he said to this, he said, it occurred to me that if a membrane as thin as toilet paper, as thin as little tissue paper, could control the vibrations of bones immense in size and weight compared to it. See, the eardrum is incredibly thin, and it doesn't weigh hardly anything, and yet a microscopic movement controls the movement of these bones that are thousands of times heavier. Then why shouldn't a larger, thicker membrane be able to vibrate in front of a piece of iron vibrate pieces of iron in front of an electromagnet. Now why? Because if you move iron in front of a magnet and attach that, those iron filings or, or that to a wire, that creates an electric pulse, an electric current that will move through the, the wire at the 
increased electric current. So you're creating a signal at one end with sound and pick, using that current at the other end to create sound. Now what am I describing? A PA system. A PA system? Oh. A phone. Who's the emitter? Alexander Graham Bell. That was his quote. See, he had no idea how to create a telephone to send a voice through a wire, but he started to understand the principle by which an ear works. You see, he wasn't a scientist, he wasn't an electric, electrical engineer, he wasn't an, an, an electrician. He was trained as a vocal physiologist because he had a deaf mother and a deaf wife. And he was trying to figure out how does the ear work. And by figuring out how God had designed an ear, he realized how we could transmit a message over a wire. Now, here's another quiz question. It goes way back to your, kid, your, your elementary school years. Uh, and, and I know my generation, all have learned this. What was the first message transmitted over a wire? Okay, shout it out really loud. Watson, come here, I heard. Okay, now that's, that is actually it's a trick question. I also heard the correct answer over here, sort of. But that was the very first thing Alexander Graham Bell said. He put, he put the receiver in another room. He put the transmitter in one room. He said, Watson, come here. In a real crackly voice, the man in another room heard a message that came across the wire. And his name was Watson. And it, the message was, Watson, come here. But that's not the first message transmitted over a wire. The first message was something that, that Samuel Morris transmitted because almost 50 years earlier we had Morris code and we figured out that you could just take a telegraph and go tap tap da 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 dash da 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 dash da 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 Morris code. You could make electrical pulses that would go for hundreds of miles over a wire and at the other end they would come across as sound or little dots and dashes on a piece of paper. Samuel Morris was a really devoted, God-fearing, Bible-believing Christian. And he wanted his first message to be really significant. First time mankind had ever transmitted a message over a wire. And his message was, what has God wrought? That ancient word, and this goes clear back to the early 18, late 1700s, is an old King James word that means made. What has God wrought? What has God made? He wanted his first thing ever transmitted to give glory to God. And by looking at what God has made, we can achieve unbelievable technological advances by first understanding what he has done. I just think that's so cool. This points right back to God when we have invented something. And because of that, microphones and speakers, you know, we have cell phones, we need to have satellites, we have TVs, we have stereo systems. We have tr satellite transmissions, all as a result of understanding how the human ear works. Otherwise, it would have never been invented. Now, just a few more useful inventions, uh, just fun stuff. Again, another Frenchman, uh, he's walking through the, the forest in 1941 with his dog, gets back and discovers that both his pants and the whole fur of his dog is just covered with this aggravating little seed pod that are stuck to him. And you have to pick each one off because they're stuck so tight for his clothing. And he guesses what that led to. Velcro. Velcro. Yeah, exactly right. But it wasn't immediate. It took 14 years for him to figure out how to make it work. So this happened in 1941. It wasn't until 1955. <coughs> that he finally perfected the ability to mass manufacture something that could simulate what God had done in nature. And as you look at these little cockaburs, uh, and this is greatly magnified, you can actually see it, see these little hooks? They have these little hooks on there. Uh, and that's exactly what you have with Velcro. You have hooks on one side and little pieces of flexible uh, material on the other side. Here they are magnified, and the hooks grab the little bits of clothing or the hairs on the dog, and that's how it works. And uh, by the way, it's still the most, to this day, the most popular way for children's shoes and attachments. In space, that's what the astronauts use. All over the space station and the space shuttles and so on, they use Velcro to attach things, uh, and it's because God did it first. Uh, here's just kind of a fun one. 
What can we learn from a dog's paw? I mean, it's, yeah, it's kind of cute. It's kind of leathery there at the bottom. It's got fur that runs in between the leather pads. Well, there was a man named Paul Sperry. This goes back to 1935. He had a pet cocker spaniel, but he loved to sail. That was his hobby. And if you've ever been on a really big sailing boat, they've got these finely lacquered wood decks. And he noticed that when he's in high waves and water's washing across the deck, even with his, his high-end deck shoes, they would sometimes slip on the deck, but his dog would just run right back and forth through that same water and not slip. And he thought, you know, this dog has leather on the bottom of his feet. I have leather on the bottom of my shoes. And from the 1400s, probably from the early, middle, the dark ages, all the way up into the 1930s, the idea was the more surface area you have on the bottom of a shoe, which is a flat leather surface, the more traction you're going to have. So there was no reason to have anything other than a flat surface because there's more contact area, there's more traction. Well, except this isn't a flat surface. There's basically a bunch of grooves. There's a V-shaped groove here, a V-shaped groove there, a V-shaped groove there, a V-shaped groove there. And he thought, well, I'll just try this. And he went on to invent deck shoes. They have all these herringbone patterns on the bottom, V-shaped grooves. That allows water to channel away so there's not a slip surface between the two surfaces. It has way better traction than a flat surface. That's what God invented when he gave dogs and balls that design, a way for water to channel away so they have more traction, not less traction. And essentially every tire, every tennis shoe has exactly that same pattern. Sometimes they use bumps, sometimes they use channels, sometimes they use ridges, but they're always shaped in these V-shaped patterns to allow water to transfer out. People don't realize the reason we know that is because God invented it with a dog's paw. Isn't that cool? This is, it's just everywhere. And this one's just kind of fun. It's a box-shaped fish. What was God thinking? Why did he make a fish in the shape of a box? It's going to be the worst design imaginable for something that's going to swim through Get the water back. efficiently. Matter of fact, this is a quote from Science Magazine. They said, this fish should swim about as well as a barn should fly. <laughs> it's the stupidest shape imaginable. Except, if you've noticed over the last decade or so, we have a bunch of these stupid box-shaped cars. <laughs> what are the automobile manufacturers thinking? Well, it turns out, when they started really looking, they noticed on the coral reefs where these fish live and the water's just flowing back and forth, you know, the really nice aerodynamically designed fish, they just get swept back and forth. These box fish with their little fins are just swimming around and they're negotiating as good or better, even though you'd think they'd have a terrible design for, like, not being able to move through water. Well, the automobile manufacturers started to, to, to study it closer. Uh, this is Chrysler Daimler. They came up with a concept car where as close as possible they try to copy the exact dimensions, size, and angle of all these fish's features at the front and the back. And they discovered it created little reverse vortexes in an air tunnel that would cancel out the drag. And it turned out to be really, really efficient. Uh, excellent maneuverability. 70 miles per gallon. Better than cars that were like lower and, and more sloped in their design with the same engine. Construction techniques. Um, and by the way, uh, a lot of these came out of just looking around and reading articles that would come out. There's a book called Discovery Design by uh, Donald DeYoung. He's the head of the Creation Research Society out of Chicago. And um, it, it's just got probably 10 times more examples that I'm sharing here. And, uh, but th these are some of my favorites that aren't, aren't as commonly known. The giant lily pad. Uh, what are we going to learn from that? Now here's a little girl sitting on this great big lily pad. A grown man can actually walk across these lily pads. But the, the surface of the leaf is, is no thicker than the surface of a leaf on, on, on like an a oak tree or something, like a big oak leaf. So you think you would just step right through them, but you don't. Because underneath, there's all these veins with, with real strong main structures.
structures and then cross beams coming across, tying it all together into a very strong structure underneath that real thin leaf structure. So what did we learn from that? What well, turns out, in 1851, kind of we're in the middle of a scientific revolution, and the world decided to have what they, was essentially the world's first World's Fair. They used to have these, I think, about every 10 years in different major cities. And this was the very first one. And they had a contest. What architect or designer can design the most fabulous building imaginable? And everybody sent in their designs. And it was won by a botanist. Not, not a uh, architect or a building designer, but a botanist, a builder, uh, or a builder. Uh, and what he designed or envisioned was what he called the Crystal Palace. It was made of 200,000 panes of glass, weighed millions of pounds, probably 10 million or more. It was 10 stories high, uh, and it covered 18 acres. And the entire outside of the building was nothing but glass. Now, this is what it looked like, uh, and it stood for 10 years or more after the fair ended. But all the experts of the day said it's guaranteed to collapse because of 10 million pounds of glass. It just, you could never support it. it. It would be too flexible. Wind would cause it to blow back and forth, so it would all crack. But he designed all of the interior exactly like a lily pad is designed. He used God's design, and it worked. The experts were all wrong. He turned out to be right. Didn't collapse. Um, one last uh, construction technique is the human hip. The human hip led to an incredibly advanced technological building. Um, as a matter of fact, this building broke the record for the tallest building ever built by mankind, where the previous record had been held for 3,800 years. Mankind built the tallest building mankind had ever built 3,800 years earlier, and it took that long for us to figure out how to build one taller. The original building was the Great Pyramid of Giza, and 3,800 years later, this building was built. And again, it was built for a World's Fair that was held in another city in 1889, uh, and it was an engineer. His first name was Gustav, and if I give you the last name, you'll know what I'm talking about immediately. You may have already. It was 1,063 feet tall. I guess you got it. The Eiffel Tower. The tallest building built in, in almost 4,000 years uh, from the previous record. Now you'll notice the main structure, and we're talking millions of pounds of solid iron, is at the center, but the support is thrown off to the sides. That's exactly what the human hips do. Our main body's weight goes right down the middle, but the main support is off to the sides of where the main mass pushes down. And it's an incredibly stable way to build a structure. And that's what uh, Gustav Eiffel looked at to design the Eiffel Tower. And again, the experts of the day said it's guaranteed to collapse. You've got to put the support directly <laughs> under the weight. Wrong. You've got to look at what God has done and realize he does things for a reason. And, and that's how the world is built. So that's just inventions of physical item, items. The, the, the world is filled with medical discoveries because of the chemicals inside of animals and plants, cancer cures, itch cures, uh, poison snake bite cures, uh, um, cures for tumors, for uh, staph for bacterial infections, for an the, in inflammations, for malaria, for antibiotics. All of these are invented because of stuff that we see happening in nature. So God has just built a smorgasbord of things for our benefit, and he expects credit for them. Last example, I think, uh, and this is a really recent one, but, and it's kind of pertinent because of, of all the scare over COVID. But they started looking for things that will kill bacterial kind of infections. Uh, COVID's a virus, but sort of not super permanent. But they realized that dragonflies and cicadas, uh, by the way, here's a dragonfly, and here's a cicada. They had these transparent wings, and when they were studying them, they discovered they have almost no bacteria. Now, almost every biological surface, including your skin, is killed, covered with 
tens of millions of bacteria. They're everywhere. And by the way, 99% of all bacteria are totally not harmful, and many of them are absolutely critical for life and very, very useful. It's only a very minute percent that we, our bodies can't handle and will cause all sorts of problems. But they discovered these ways you still have herlating bacteria on them. They thought, wow, it must have some new antibacterial chemical. And they went looking for it. They couldn't find anything. No, no chemical there that seemed to be killing bacteria. But then they looked at the structure of the wings, and they discovered the wings are covered with all these little nano bumps. Now, these are just microns in diameter and height. Okay, really, really small. You need an electron microscope to see them. When a bacteria lands on them, the weight of the bacteria will cause it to start to settle down to the point these little spikes will puncture through the bacteria's membrane. And then it will dot the insides, will ooze out, and it dies. So the surface itself is designed to be an antibacterial surface. Now this is cool. Scientists are working really hard to try to figure out how to make a surface with that sort of a shape and manufacture on a mass basis. So they put little doorknobs and hospital surfaces and railings. And all of a sudden, you don't need chemicals. You're killing bacteria without even putting any chemicals on them. Isn't that kind of cool? Because God did it first. So here's where we're going to wrap up in the last few minutes. This is that other quote. God says, tells us, ask the beasts, they will teach you. The birds of the heaven, they will tell you. The fishes of the earth, they will teach you. The fish of the sea, they will declare to you. And here's the key point. Who among all of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? Amen. It is obvious. God has made all these things, and he's made them for our benefit. And only the foolish pretend there is no God. You see, God in his word defines the very, what is a fool? A fool is a person who says there is no God. He says it twice in the book of Psalms. It's in two different Psalms. Because God wants us to know it. It is utter foolishness to leave God out of our thinking. And, and we, we miss so much and we lose so much. And ultimately we lose our connection with him. So what's the world do? They look at these marvelous things and they throw the word evolution at them. That explains it. Or mutations, just random changes caused it to adapt. Or adaptation. Or what made Charles Darwin so famous was the idea that if there are little changes from one generation to the next, and those changes are useful, one animal can transform into another animal. And there's all sorts of examples of this. Without a doubt, there are changes. Without a doubt, there are mutations in both humans and every other form of life. But can it change one animal into another? So that's what the wagon is for. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story. See, when I was young, I had a wagon like this. You know, and it was my mode of transportation. I would just you know, drive around in my wagon, and I could go places, and I could put stuff in it. But, you know, as I got older and my friends got older, they would get bicycles or, you know, they get motorcycles or cars. But I was kind of a dreamer. I grew up in the 60s. And I didn't just want, you know, a car or a motorcycle. What I really wanted was, whoops, where did it go? Well, I didn't want a bigger wagon either. <laughs> it's kind of nice, but I didn't want a bigger wagon. That's me. What I really wanted was the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> Who grew up during the years of Star Trek? Yeah, a bunch of old folks here. <laughs> yeah. Captain Kirk was way better than all those new Star Trek commanders. Anyway. <laughs> but the difference between that little red wagon and a spaceship is like the difference between a bacteria and a human being. There's that magnitude of difference. In every textbook, every museum, Everything in every biology class our kids will go through, all this stuff on the internet, natural history museums, it all either says or implies that bacteria turned into human beings. Yeah. By this process of natural selection, little changes, if they're useful, slowly it develops new abilities and things. It turns into a more complex animal. And students just accept it. So the analogy is, how could you turn this wagon into a spaceship? You've got to add enormous amounts of information. You've got to add all sorts of parts that weren't there to begin with. Well, here's how life works. The wagon rolls off the assembly line, and to make the very next wagon, there is a book attached to the bottom of the wagon. That's the DNA code. Okay? And this book is just filled with information. Page after 
text. A mutation is like changing one letter on one page randomly. And then I may turn over 10 or 100 pages, and now maybe I move a word to a different spot. I turn over another 100 pages, and I like move a letter and exchange it with another letter. Those are mutations. To build the next wagon, you have to take the information of the DNA code. You take that information, you use it to make the second wagon. But it has, see it has a thousand pages, there's now ten mistakes. So you're building a new wagon with a bunch of information with ten mutations, and there's just ten random rearrangements of the information. Has anybody ever read, like, say a thousand page book, and there's ten mistakes in the book, ten misspelled words? <coughs> Do you think you're going to be able to read and comprehend that book? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's not going to make any difference. But the second book is used to make the third book, which is used to make the third wagon. <coughs> this is how life works. Ten wagons later, you don't have ten mistakes in your book. You have a hundred mistakes in the book. One every <coughs> ten pages. A thousand books later, you have a mistake on every single page, a random rearrangement of the words. 10,000 pages later, and by the way, it would take less than a year to have 10,000 generations of a bacteria. So if you're starting with bacteria, within a year, you now have 10 mistakes on every single page. At some point, that information is going to start giving you wagons where you know, the wheels are falling off. Natural selection is God's quality control department in a factory. Life is like a factory recreating more forms of life. The quality control department, it can't think. It only says, is the wagon the right size? Is it the right shape? Is it the right color? Do the wheels spin? Off it goes to the market to see how well it will sell. Natural selection, if an animal's defective, it doesn't survive as well, it goes extinct so that the animals that have the correct information function better. It doesn't create any new information. It only filters out stuff that doesn't work well. So eventually wagons are going to start falling apart. They're going to quit being built. Eventually so many mistakes are going to happen that you can't even build a wagon that functions the whole thing and the factory's going to go extinct. Life is going to die out of that form. That is happening to every single form of life in creation. Your children have more mistakes, genetic mistakes, than you had. You had more than your parents had. So if you go back in time, there's less and less and less mistakes. As we go forward in time, there's more and more and more mistakes. The lifetime of humanity dropped off from almost a thousand years in length to the current about 80 to 90 years in length. And by the way, the last page of my new devotional, I talk about the brevity of life. It's a phenomenal ending of this book. And why God says it's better to go to a funeral than a wedding. Because we start focusing on eternity. Amen. And I looked at the statistics. Only one person out of 30 is going to live to be 90 years old. 29 out of 30 people are going to die before then. We're going to drop like flies in our 80s. And only one person out of 2,000 will live to be 100. That is reality. And nothing is going to stop it. Because every cell in our body, every time it divides, it has more and more random mistakes, like that book in the bottom of the wagon. So could that process of these random mistakes ever turn this wagon into a spaceship? It's absurd. It goes against everything we know about scientific knowledge. But here's what the kids are shown. Occasionally, a mutation will happen and it has a useful functional purpose. An example that's in all the textbooks is that there are fish and like salamanders that will work their way into a cave where there's never any light and a mutation will happen where they will become permanently blind and all of their offspring will be blind. And because of that, about one third of the energy and information and nutrition that goes to the brain is used to process visual images. Well, they don't have to process those visual images, so all that energy can go for other functions. And that's why blind people often have incredible senses in other areas. So it's actually an advantage to be blind in a dark cave. And they'll say, see, this is how a mutation allowed an animal to function better. But it's only in a very narrow 
a specific environment. And an analogy is this, and this is what we need to be training our children when they're being deceived by these kind of examples. Suppose there's 500 people in a movie theater, and one of those people are blind. And someone, the lights go out, and it's totally dark, and someone yells, fire! And everybody panics. Of those 500 people, who is most likely to function the best? The blind man. Does that mean he is more evolutionarily advanced and is advancing and becoming a different kind of human being? Absolutely not. See, all you've got to do is explain to kids these kind of things. That took about 30 seconds. And they're going to realize this whole idea of mutations creating advancing creatures is absurd. It's simply something that is a loss of information. And every mutation is a loss of information has a useful function in a very narrow niche environment. Um, so those are the kind of things we have to help people understand. Um, okay. And that's where I want to wrap up. The, the problem with evolution is twofold. And this is how what we have to help people understand. With Christians, it directly contradicts, undermines, and destroys people's trust in God's word. Because it means God's word can't mean what it says. Right. Evolution means there's a continuum of life from bacteria to people, and that everything made itself. And, and it means God can't communicate in a clear, straightforward way, because the Bible doesn't mean what it actually says. So where you start and where you stop believing it. You see that slippery slope? And second, and this is probably more important for the non-Christian world, it doesn't work. Scientifically, it does not make sense. It doesn't explain life. It doesn't explain the complexity of life. It doesn't explain the beginning of life. It doesn't explain the advancement of life. It just explains how things can maintain themselves. And there are changes so that there's lots of varieties of a given kind of life. But it doesn't show how a new form of life can develop. Uh, and folks, because they never hear these things, don't get to understand it or comprehend it. So I hope it was a kind of a fun look at what God has done for a benefit, but also ends with helping you understand how deceptive the idea of evolution is and why it can't be true. So tomorrow night, the worldwide flood, and uh, thank you for having me again. sticking out the side that it flips, does like this, and it's got two more little fins down at the back that it waves back and forth, and using those little fins, because it, God designed it just perfectly, it can turn really sharp and it can move through water to go where it wants to go. So it's shaped like a box, but it swims like a really cool fish. Cool. Yep. Richie. How big is the box fish? They're not very big, they're about that big, about six inches. They're not a very big fish. Okay, up front here. Well, that's why you have a mutation of a mule, but they cannot reproduce. Yep, yep, it's a mutation. It's not an advantage to not be able to reproduce. You, you <laughs> gotta breed, breed them to make them mules. So we got one over here, then we'll call it quits. What's the, what's the number one piece of evidence you would put in front of somebody who claimed to believe in evolution? I would pose it as a question. Um, and uh, my number one go-to is, can you explain how uh, soft tissue, where we've measured the, the, how fast it disappears and the molecules fly apart and they're at most tens of thousands of years, proteins, collagen, blood cells, DNA, how those can still be found in fossils that we're told are hundreds of millions of years old when we know it couldn't be around for more than tens of thousands. How can you explain that? And by the way, you've got to follow up a little bit because these people aren't stupid. And, um, you'll, 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 and then I want to talk about a couple resources. I always forget to do that. Um, 
Mary Schweitzer, who found that soft tissue first, and now it's been found in all sorts of other fossils of <laughs> dinosaurs, okay, these proteins that shouldn't be there, hundreds of them. Um, she realized that if you take a, um, a fragile biological molecule like DNA or a protein, it's a long chain of beads, and if you can get iron to react with it, it sort of caps the ends, so it helps preserve it and it'll last longer. She, she knew this before she did the experiment. And she started thinking, well, where could, where could get iron to preserve these tissues? Well, there's iron in our blood. So she took chicken bones that have all of these biological molecules inside of them. Um, <coughs> and then she took blood. She spun the blood down in the centrifuge so she could remove all the clotting agents. Then she chemically reacted the blood so the iron became active. She poured the blood into the bones and she put it there on the bench for a year. Then she had other bones that were just in water with no blood. And she found out that, yeah, the stuff with the iron that she'd made chemically active helped preserve that tissue longer, now about 10 times longer. So not for millions of years, but maybe for, for 100,000 instead of 10,000 at most. Well, now, all, all the, internet, the internet sites and the atheist sites and the textbooks, they're starting to say, well, we now, we now know how this tissue survived. It's been preserved by iron. But there's no place in nature where you find an anticoagulant. There's no place in nature where you find blood, iron from blood being chemically activated. There's no explanation of how you migrate that blood out of the blood cells and into the tissue. So there's all of these problems that are just totally ignored and yet kids are given a superficial answer supposedly explaining it. So you gotta, be, you gotta kind of read a little bit. When you ask a question, you gotta kind of know what's the answer likely to be, and then help them understand when you realize you're not being told the whole truth, and here's what's being left out. And then they have to deal with that. The second one is that the genetic code of every creature is deteriorating downwards. Um, Mutations are destroying information. Uh, it used to be taught back in the 50s before they discovered DNA that if there is one permanent random mutation per generation to the hum to human beings, um, we are guaranteed to go extinct within hundreds of thousands of years um, because they're gonna build up and build up and build up. Um, we now know there are hundreds per generation. It's an absolute proven scientific fact. And, 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 they're, and they're 99%, um, well actually they're in the, the high 90%, they don't seem to have a given effect. Um, and the next few percent are um, deleterious, they cause allergies, diseases, uh, deformation of babies, birth defects, those are all mutations. Um, and there's not one known mutation that's ever had a beneficial purpose in a human being. Um, so, how do you explain things advancing upwards when all the data seems to be showing we're genetically deteriorating? And to my knowledge, there are no answers to either one of those issues. And they both point to a literal creation. And the last one, sorry, I'm, I'm, this is really an important question um, that, I, that I come back to is um, something that's, things are irreducibly complex. Remember this morning I showed you a little molecular motor inside of a bacteria? That motor has 40 parts. How can evolution explain a motor building itself? Because if any one of those parts are missing, it doesn't work. You have to have all 40. You can't take one of the motors driving this fan and remove a part, and it's going to work. All of them have to be there. All of them have to be perfectly designed. All of them have to be placed in exactly the right position. How can you explain that one small change at a time? Because every step of the way is going to be a waste of energy, a waste of resources, and a useless something inside of that creature's body. It's essentially going to be a tumor. It's going to be a detriment until it all, it's all there and it all works. They don't have an answer. It's, how do you explain metamorphosis? A, a caterpillar, a worm-like creature, dissolving itself into goo and coming out as a butterfly in a step at a, a time change. See, there's no answer to these things. So you just kind of put that kind of stuff in front of folks. Okay. And they'll struggle with it. And don't let them off the hook by just saying, well, evolution did it. Right. Yeah. Thank you. All right. The only thing I can say is this. God is good, isn't he? Amen. 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 It's amazing all of that. So be back here tomorrow evening, 6 o'clock. Uh, have your questions. Bruce loves questions. I know all right. And let's pray and get out of here, shall we? Lord, thank you for your goodness. Lord, thank you for the way that you have taken care of us, Lord. And, uh, just the way everything is pointed to you in creation. Lord, we 
know that the world doesn't look at that as what it should be, but Lord, we are so grateful. Lord, thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are made with a purpose. Lord, and you have given us that. Thank you, Lord.